Hey everybody, Eric here for the Unlockables podcast, and before we begin this episode, I just want to give a special shout out to all the people who support the show over on Patreon. These incredible people are Chris from One Hour One Decision, Stephen Pay, Dave Jackson, Chris Copleen, Rick Firestone, Colby Moyer, Keith Gasper, Nikolai at Night, Mass Keaton, Ashton Ruby, Chris from A Novel Console, and Ryan from Listoff. I am eternally grateful for your guys' continued support for this creative endeavor and can never thank you enough. Now, on to today's episode. is going on everybody welcome back to another exciting episode of the unlockables podcast the story of video games the people who play them and the memories made along the way as always i am your host eric and i'd like to thank you for tuning in wherever whenever in time and space you might be located means so much that you're willing to check out the show and see what is going on in the world of video games now today we've got a really really awesome episode ever since i've been podcasting i've kind of made it a yearly tradition for the last couple of years now to do what I call a summer mailbag. And that is where I had members of our Discord community, members of the video game community in general, whoever was willing to uh, submit some questions for me to answer. They can be about games, they could be about sports, movies, just completely off the wall, random scenarios, anything that anybody would like to ask and submit. And normally I spend uh, about an hour, hour and a half just answering them, talking about them. And we generally have a good time. This feels, man, the last couple of weeks, months, it's just, it's been a grind with finishing up Kingdom Hearts 2. It's been mostly a video game grind, uh, very heavily centered around Square Enix. So it's kind of nice to get back to just kind of a regular general generic episode, not having to worry about Nomura or Square Enix. So very, very nice. I'm very, very excited to dive into this one. And we've got a lot of, Fantastic questions from a lot of really, really great friends, a lot of really, really great people. So I would say without further ado, let's not waste any time and let's go ahead and dive in to the 2023 Summer Mailbag. First up, we got a question from Mikey Tabletop, a.k.a. Mikey from the Big Drink Energy podcast. Great show. Great person. Go check out that show and say hi to Mikey in any one of the numerous Discord servers we are in. And he asks, you have a time machine and can go back to any concert in the past. Who are you seeing? And he adds a couple caveats here. It doesn't have to be anybody big or a big festival like Woodstock or anything. It could be a concert you missed last weekend or seeing somebody in a garage basement before they were famous. So uh, I took a few minutes to think about this one. My overall generic kind of just popular answer to this question, because I've I've been asked this a couple of times and you know, you just, when you're drinking beers with your buddies, like what if you go back in time and see something or kill Hitler or whatever. Uh, But my number one answer to this is always like the generic answer off the cuff is queen, because I think I was born like just after or like during when Freddie Mercury died. And I just have heard the stories about what a showman he was. And just when you listen to Queen, their harmonies and their their melodies are just so incredible. And I think that would just be a concert to to remember after, you know, I've seen what was the movie uh, where they did the biopic on the movie of his life with uh, Rami Malek, who played him. I don't remember the name of it, but it was absolutely incredible. And I've watched footage of that Live Aid concert, the last one that he ever did. 
and it's just absolutely incredible. So I, I think Queen would probably be like my generic number one. Uh, a close second now, now that he's gone, and I kind of regret not going to see Linkin Park. Uh, rest in peace, Chester Bennington. I think that seeing them live would have been really, really incredible. I wouldn't say I was like a diehard Linkin Park fan when I was growing up, but they kind of came into relevance as I was growing up. So Linkin Park is very much a band that is part of my childhood, part of my late middle school years, early high school years, very much one of the bands that shaped a lot of my my taste in music and was really, really popular uh, back in the day. I say I think I probably first heard about them when I was in about sixth grade, I would say. And they got really big when they did that collab album with Jay-Z. And that's kind of when I when I heard about them. So I think those would be my two. Uh, I agree with you. I would love to see one of my early pop punk idols in a basement garage setting because that would just be such a cool story to be like, hey, I saw these guys. A short list of that is Fall Out Boy, New Found Glory, one of those, um, Blink-182, any of those, seeing any of those guys in like a, like a house show or a, a garage or a basement would be absolutely incredible. Final meme answer, I would go back in time because it was 10 years ago recently uh, to the Denny's show. What the fuck is up, Denny's? I think that would be a legendary moment to be able to experience live for sure. So, Mikey, thank you so much for the question. And uh, I don't. by the time this episode comes out, uh, I'm going to one concert this year. I actually am going to Fall Out Boy. They're coming through on their, their big world tour. They're coming to Chicago. And we're going to see them in Wrigleyville. And I'm very, very excited. They were one of the early bands that shaped my musical tastes. And actually, when I was in college, I had a, everybody took, I went to college at University of Illinois in Chicago, and everybody took different English classes that had different topics. And the class that I signed up for had a topic around music and recording and the way people write and critique about music. And my term paper was a 25 page paper centered around a band of my choosing. And at the time, like I said, I was really into pop punk and Fall Out Boy were one of my my big idols, my big inspirations. So I wrote a 25 page paper on Fall Out Boy and the way that the music industry and giant record labels interfere with the creative process and change acts that come up and become really big to fit the mold of what the recording industry wants. And this was shortly after Fully Ado came out, I believe. And I think right around then they went on hiatus. So uh, did a 25-page paper on that, kind of just diving into the history of the music industry and Fall Out Boy coming up in the suburbs of Chicago. It was really, really cool. I, I don't have the paper anymore, but I got an A-plus on it. So uh, that's kind of like my – I wrote a 25-page paper on Fall Out Boy in college and got an A-plus on it. So absolutely wild times. Next up we have – Good friend of the show since the beginning, Dave Jackson from Tales from the Backlog. And he asks, what's a game series you want to get into but are scared of by a long time commitment or number of games in the series? Yeah, so there's been several lately that I've really wanted to get into and be part of conversations. It just seems really, really intimidating. My one-off game answer to this question is Persona 5. I think maybe the Persona series in general, but Persona 5 specifically, people keep telling me that it's 100 hours of playtime and I just don't have the the time to commit to 100 hours plus of of a playthrough. I say as I sit here and play all the Kingdom Hearts games and put 80 plus hours into Tears of the Kingdom, but uh, I digress. I think that's a reason why I've just kind of stayed away from Persona 5 and just haven't tackled yet because I just haven't found a stretch of time that I could tackle it. My overall series-wide answer to this is the Yakuza series. I know the Yakuza series by reputation. It is a series that has always fascinated me of just how zany and insane it is. And I know based on listening to a couple episodes that Dave has done and several other people in our podcasting community that Yakuza has these ridiculously long cutscenes that can be like 40 to 50 minutes. And I think right now, again, the same problem with Persona 5 is that there are so many Yakuza games and they're all so long that it just seems very, very intimidating to get into all of them, even though I know 100% hands down that I would love the series. It seems like something that's right up my alley and has a lot of love and care and, and a really big fan base around it. I do have Yakuza 0. I bought it on a Steam sale 
last year, and I think it works on the Steam Deck, so I do have that. I'm I'm ready to dive into it. Again, I'm just kind of timing-wise, and I'm recording so many other things and playing so many other games right now. I've been, for like the last year, really itching to start it, and I, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe talking to you guys is that Yakuza 0 is kind of the spot to start, and then I would pick up the games more going on from there because, uh, yeah, Yakuza's become... I always know it's had a really big following, but it seems like the last few years especially, it's gotten really, really big. And I first heard of Yakuza from Video Game Donkey. I watched his videos on it. It just looks like absolute crazy madness. And at this point, I know Kiryu by reputation <laughs> just because I've heard so much about him. And I think it's it's definitely time overdue that I experienced Yakuza. I think the other quick answer to uh, second after that is probably Metal Gear Solid. I haven't experienced anything Kojima and I think it would be right at my wheelhouse because of how much I worship at the altar of Tetsuya Nomura so I'm totally fine with insane batshit crazy storytelling I don't think that would be a problem for me at all but again I just think it's a a time thing I don't have the ability to go back and play all of those games so I think Yakuza and Metal Gear Solid are, are the two right off the top of my head that I'm like Man, I, I really should have checked those out. I really should have played out of played all of them. I've been doing better about going back and playing things that I've missed the last couple of years, especially podcasting. Uh, knocked off a couple of Legend of Zelda's. Uh, I've played all of the Final Fantasies from seven onward now, and I'm gonna start diving into one through six. So that's coming up, and I'm going back and replaying all the Kingdom Hearts games. So I've been going back and playing stuff that I've been wanting to, but I think Yakuza is probably gonna be the next one for sure. We're getting some of the uh, hashtag don't post here questions, uh, infamous channel on my Discord server, hashtag don't post here, that uh, if you want to check out what that's all about, <laughs> go ahead and join the Discord server. Uh, that's a great time. So next question is from good friend of the show and big inspiration of mine, Chris Copleen from the Retro Hangover podcast, has a couple of questions here. First, he asks, if Melina said she ate ass, yay or nah? And Melina is a terrifying character from Mortal Kombat with very, very sharp teeth and wide jaws. So uh, based on <laughs> principle alone, I'm going to have to say, uh, hell no, absolutely not. I would not survive that encounter. I don't think it would be pleasurable <laughs> in the least bit. So I'm going to have to say uh, no. Nice short answer about that one. Follow-up question from Chris. Also... He asks, Final Fantasy IX or Crazy Taxi? Now, I know what you guys are probably thinking, anybody that comes to this later, maybe from outside of our little podcast community, Chris and Shane and some of the other guys that they know run a yearly competition called the King of Games, where they pit X number of games against each other in a tournament-style format and decide once and for all what is the best game of that year. And this is a infamous moment from the one of the first tournaments that I listened to them do which was the King of Games 2000 where it was Final Fantasy 9 versus Crazy Taxi and I listened to that episode recently because I, I saw this question come up and I needed to be reminded about that controversy of course and those that know me listen to this show if you haven't before you'll know that Final Fantasy 9 is one of my favorite games of all time so based on that alone, I'm going to have to go with Final Fantasy IX. I'm totally not salty about it at all, but uh, if you don't want to spoil it for King Games 2000, go ahead and like skip ahead 30 to 60 seconds or whatever until you hear me stop talking about this. I understand why the arguments you were made for Crazy Taxi. I have played Crazy Taxi maybe once in my entire life, but something about it, it was such a cultural force that people kind of just like remember it like a lot of people would just be like no I've never played Crazy Taxi but I saw it in any kind of like whatever arcades were left at the year 2000 and the guy would go Crazy Taxi and you just know about it like just you absorbed it from your surroundings so I mean that has to be for something but I mean I think Final Fantasy 9 it's not one of the more I think when you look at a game in the context of King, King of Games, right, you have to kind of look at the context as a whole. And at the time in 2000, Final Fantasy IX was kind of like 
looked at with a raised eyebrow because it was a departure from what they were doing in seven and eight. It was a return to some of the older style fan high fantasy themes of earlier Final Fantasies, which I I love very much. But I would think if you were to go down and just talk about it like 10, 15 years down the road, like now Final Fantasy IX has a very good reputation for being one of the better Final Fantasies. It is the highest scored Final Fantasy on Metacritic, uh, believe it or not. That's why context is important in these conversations. So I think personally, I, I would have picked Final Fantasy IX, but that is because I have a lot of nostalgia around that one. And when picking things in King of Games, you can listen to 1992 coming going through right now, uh, especially some of the episodes I'm on. I try to be very contextual about it and take in all the information, look at the game as a whole, its place in history, how it's looked at now, the things that it did. But this one would be very difficult for me because Final Fantasy IX was literally the first RPG I ever played, and it holds a very special place in my heart. So, yeah, Final Fantasy IX, I'm not salty about it, and I will have vengeance for it one day. So be on the lookout for whenever we do. <laughs> be on the lookout for later King of Games appearances when I make my move to claim vengeance for Final Fantasy IX. One last question from Chris. He, he said, real question, don't ignore the other two. They're all real questions. It's fantastic. But he asks, if you were to hold a panel at a con, where would it ideally be and what would it ideally be about? So I think the easiest place for me to hold a panel would be at the closest con to me is my hometown. Not my hometown, but a town that city I love very much, which would be in Chicago. And Chicago every year has the C2E2, the Chicago Comic and Entertainment Expo, which is basically like Chicago's Comic Con. It's not as big as New York Comic Con or San Diego Comic Con or some of the other ones, but I would say probably in the Midwest, it is one of the biggest con type environments next to Gen Con. And uh, I know there's one up in Wisconsin, Milwaukee, that's the Midwest Gaming uh, Con that they have every year there. So C2E2 is probably one of the the, the biggest, I, I would say it's probably in the, the tier below San Diego and New York Comic Cons is kind of like importance. So that's where I would want to do it because it's, it's pretty close to me. This question really appealed to my anxiety because I have big time imposter syndrome and think that I don't know anything. So the only topic I would feel comfortable about doing any kind of panel would be probably something Kingdom Hearts or Tetsuya Nomura related. I think there are some good topics I could touch around the themes in the games, uh, you know, like a big theme that people don't really think about in Kingdom Hearts, the series as a whole is the manipulation of the younger main characters by adults. And I think that has a very good real world parallel, especially in our current political climate, where there's a big conversation around indoctrination in education and, you know, the, the battle seems to be very much over the heart and soul and mind of the of the younger kids about what they're being taught. So throughout the entirety of Kingdom Hearts, Sora and Riku and Kairi and, and everybody are always, all the younger characters are always being manipulated by the older people who have agendas and they don't always realize it right away and the adults get away with this manipulation and it causes, you know, severe setbacks and severe trauma to all of these these young characters and obviously kingdom hearts 2 is in themes about there are themes in there about overcoming trauma and and you know fighting back against this but i think even the characters that you would fall on the side of good that had moments of manipulation we just wrapped up kingdom hearts 2 on guiding keys and, and one of the things that uh, we at the end of the game it we revealed that diz is ansem the wise and we find the real ansem ansem the wise and he says that he manipulates Sora and Riku in his quest to get revenge on Organization 13. So I think that there's some interesting topic, topics in there. I think the inner journey of Riku, how he goes through depression and wanting to hide himself off from the world and the way that he grows as a person also has a lot of good real world parallels. And the way the different members of the organization represent kind of different obsessive character traits is also a good topic. I could talk a little bit about Tetsuya Nomura and that in his time with with Square and when Kingdom Hearts was being formed because his whole career arc is is very fascinating and kind of you don't get Kingdom Hearts without Tetsuya Nomura and the way that everything that he worked on and the people that he worked with and working with Disney and, and the things that happened around Final Fantasy versus 13 and the way that 
that was his baby and it kind of got derailed, but is now kind of coming back and manifesting itself in the end of Kingdom Hearts 3 and Kingdom Hearts 4. So there's there's a lot of good stuff around that. And I think that people in the Kingdom Hearts community would be very open to that. I would also uh, be willing, I know this was like teased like one time, and we were kind of like joking about it, but uh, Chris, if there's ever like a King of Games panel where we went through that, uh, I would be, I know I'm probably not on the higher tier to say that, but I would be very interested in like, making the journey for that and talking about that because I think that would be uh, super cool to talk about that and meet up with you guys and just have a fun time talking about how we came up with the <laughs> messed up decisions we did for, for King of Games. So that would be very cool. Uh, just give me a call when you're ready to, to do, talk about that and do that. Next up, we have Adam from The Good, The Bad, and The Backlog. Adam, thank you so much for the question, sir. And again, we're going <laughs> to another one that might go into hashtag don't post here. So he asks, would you rather rollerblade down the street naked or live stream your colonoscopy? I got to admit, I spent like a whole lunch break thinking about this question because I think there are pros and cons to either side, right? I'm a very private person, so the idea of my colonoscopy being live streamed to everybody <laughs> on the internet is not appealing to me at all. Live streaming is an awfully brutal arena. I mean, that's just when you do something on there and it gets clipped and shared for the entire world to see, it goes viral. And I'm not sure that I want... <laughs> A colonoscopy. I, I'm not sure I want my viral moment to be of my colonoscopy. I would like it to be something a little, a little more tame. Maybe just I, I don't even know what my viral moment would be, but I certainly don't want it to be that. Uh, like I said, I'm a very private, shy person. I've come out of my shell more as I've grown up. Uh, I used to not want to be naked in front of anybody, but uh, you know, I think rollerblading, rollerblading naked down the street would be something that I could like live with <laughs> I don't know if I could live with live streaming a colonoscopy so for that reason we're gonna rollerblade down the street naked although I probably would eat shit because I have not rollerbladed or skateboarded or done any kind of wheel-based transportation other than a car for probably the last 10 years the next series of questions comes from Keith from the main quest podcast oh uh, let's hang on to your Fasten your seatbelts for this series of questions. All right. Starts off relatively tame. So question number one, what character do you think deserves their own spin-off game? I got kind of a similar question to this, so I kind of had to come up with a different answer for this one. That question will be coming later. It was my initial gut reaction. What character do you think deserves their own spin-off game? I want a Tom Nook style tycoon game where you build your own capitalist empire through any legal, illegal means necessary. I want to control the prices. I want to control market fluctuations. I want to control the turn up stock market. I want to control it all. And I want to start building my tiny nook empire from one neighborhood and expand it to all of the United States of Animal Crossing. So, but it can't be like the nice E for everyone friendly. It's got to be like, it's got to be like a little dark and a little gritty. So like a teen game, maybe. Uh, I mean, Roller Coaster Tycoon, you could like launch people off of roller coasters and drown them. So, I mean, something on the level of that, but I want to be able to build my Tom Nook empire and basically become an elitist one percenter in the world of Animal Crossing. So let's make that happen. Next question from Keith. He asks, if a sleazy millionaire offered you 10 million to just sit around naked with them and play a video game with them all day, what game would it be? I had a hard time with this question because $10 million is a lot of money. <laughs> I would probably sell out to any <laughs> millionaire that would ask me to do that, any rich person, because I mean, 10 million is 10 million and I could do a lot of good with that money and take care of a lot of people, as terrible as that sounds. Uh, man, what game wouldn't it be? If you keep, if you roll up to 10 million, it's like we're sitting at my house naked and we're just playing this game for 10 million. I don't think I'd say no to like any game at all my worst nightmare would be if like elon musk came up and offered me 10 million dollars and like wanted me to sit around naked and play some like cringy hentai waifu game with him uh, i would absolutely hate that that would be awful 
I think it would be wild to play something like Halo with Bill Gates because he like was still with Microsoft when the Xbox was invented. And I don't even know if like he knows what's going on with that anymore because he's too busy trying to, you know, put microchips all in all of us. <laughs> and I'm going to go down the conspiracy theory uh, wormhole there. But I think <laughs> I, I maybe maybe that would be the answer. Uh, maybe play some 2K with like Mark Cuban or something like that. I, I don't know. Uh, maybe <laughs> I, I, I don't I honestly don't know. That question makes me really uncomfortable, but it, I would probably be any one of them for $10 million and any game that they wanted to pick. So that's how I'm going to answer that question. Next, he asks, what constitutes a Jill sandwich? Referencing the infamous line from Resident Evil is like, you were almost a Jill sandwich. And I even looked up the, the, the moment that it happened and just kind of got my thoughts together about this question. And I actually went a lot deeper for this question than I wanted to. So what constitutes a Jill sandwich? And I was like, well, what actually is a Jill sandwich? And then I got philosophical with it. I was like, well, why is a Jill sandwich? And I think a Jill sandwich is actually like a metaphor. It's similar to how you can be stuck between a rock and a hard place. So a Jill sandwich is ultimately like a difficult situation you find yourself in. And the outcome could have been like really, really bad. Like maybe you fucking die or like severely injured or like you put your entire house on like a 14 leg parlay and are about to lose it and you barely avoid doing that. It's like, well, that could have been a Jill sandwich. You know, that could have been a really, really bad situation, but you managed to escape or have a more favorable outcome that maybe still kind of sucks, but is more favorable than the worst case scenario. So to me, that's what encapsulates the concept of a Jill sandwich. Honestly, a Jill sandwich is probably just a product of just stupid writing because they thought that was funny back then. Be like, oh, it's a Jill sandwich. Do they keep the Jill sandwich line in the RE remake? Did, did somebody tell me that, please? I'd be curious to know. I just know it from the original. But yeah, Jill sandwich. Next question, he asks, if you could motorboat any video game character, top or bottom, you have consent as well, who would it be? These questions are getting a little bit hashtag don't post here for me. It's, it's, it's a little bit. So uh, I decided to be super literal in every sense of the word, and I went after the uh, boat concept of this question uh, in the spirit of keeping the episode pg uh, it would be a boat from hydro thunder because those are actually boats that would be super fun to motor around in and drive around because those boats can go really fast you could pick any game that has a boat maybe it's wave race 64 maybe it's grand theft auto 5 i know has boats but i don't know if any of the other ones have boats because i never played any of the other ones so yeah i would motor boat around in one of the boats from hydro thunder I know it's not what you wanted to hear, but that's how I'm going to answer it. So keep your questions in hashtag don't post here, please. I appreciate it very much. <laughs> Another one he asks, what's a video game 9-11 you'll never forget, i.e. the plate falling on Sector 7 in Final Fantasy 7, the Katina stage in Star Fox 64. So I wasn't sure if this strictly had to like remain to tragedies or if this was just like the never forget portion of 9-11 you know it's like something that stuck with you that you'd never forget so I tried to interpret this the best I could and I came up with a couple of them I know this is probably a cliche answer and no one's expecting this out of me considering how much shit I've given the <laughs> Call of Duty series but uh the first time that I really remember like a oh shit moment in video games was maybe not the first moment but the first one of the ones that sticks with me the most to this day is the no Russian mission from Modern Warfare 2 where you're going through the airport and gunning down civilians. That was, I just remember at the time, we kind of gotten past this thing. There's still a little bit of this ruckus about video game violence and this mission in particular kicked up the hornet's nest once more. It couldn't have been an easy decision for Infinity War to include something like this in their blockbuster Call of Duty game and the follow-up to Call of Duty Modern Warfare. But, you know... Uh, that scene is just, it's very, very shocking. And it's a situation that you find yourself in given the gravitas of the story of the modern warfare trilogy, which I think is pretty decent, uh, compared to a lot of other stuff. It's certainly like no halo in terms of FPS storytelling, but no Russian was, was rough. And that's one I still think about from time to time this, this, to this day. 
that was a chilling scene. There are a couple I know just by reputation that I've never played. Uh, Kefka destroying the world is an event I know just by reputation. Uh, Aerith getting killed is a shocking moment, I think, for anybody that got to experience that for sure. One of my other favorite never forget moments is the the last stand in Halo Reach is just everything about Halo Reach is fantastic. It's such a great Halo game because it could have gone wrong and fallen flat in so many ways because throughout the Halo mythos, the first couple of games you play, like you know what happens to Reach that it gets completely annihilated. So when the game starts off on Reach and you're playing as these characters that are nowhere present in Halo 3, like you know what's going to happen to them. It's only a matter of time. So playing through the campaign is kind of like this fruitless struggle against the inevitable. And it crescendos to this moment where everyone escapes from Reach and you as your Spartan character are the last remaining person. And your last mission objective is to just survive. And you just survive for as long as possible until eventually you're you're overwhelmed. And that is a very, very intense moment that I've never really experienced in a game since I mean, like, I've never really thought about that. Uh, and then, of course, I have to throw in a Kingdom Hearts one. Uh, Sora stabbing himself and turning into a Heartless in KH1 is a very pivotal and shocking moment. I remember seeing that scene when I was younger playing this game back in 2001, 2002. At the time, I didn't know about Final Fantasy VII. I didn't know about the big Aerith twist. So to me, this was something completely new. I, I wasn't expecting one of the main characters to stab himself and appear for all intents and purposes to like die. So that was a moment that I'll never forget as well. I know they're not like disaster level things like how they would relate to 9-11, but you know, that's my answer for that. Uh, would you rather have Bayonetta or Wario step on your nuts? Keep in mind, Bayo has guns for heels and Wario is Wario. Uh, man, that's a no win situation either way, but <laughs> in the spirit of the question, I don't think it's going to be Bayonetta just because gun heels seem more dangerous than anything that Wario is doing with his life. So <laughs> I'm going to have to go with Wario on that one. Bonus question. Last one from Keith. Your wife wants to listen to the DK rap while you do the Donkey Konga. <laughs> W-Y-D. What you do. Listen, I'm not going to hate on the DK rap because it is a masterpiece of video game music it is such i hope it goes into the hall of fame i hope that if earth gets destroyed by an alien invasion or asteroid strike that whoever comes next finds this and this is our shining example of music composure <laughs> to whoever comes after us so uh you know if it comes on shuffle while things are going <laughs> i won't turn it off <laughs> all right we have entered the Jared from Play Along Podcast section of the Q&A. Jared infamous for just unloading questions on people whenever they have Q&A episodes. So the first question he asks, he says, you're scrolling through Poke Tinder. Who are you swiping right for? In parentheses, he says, right is the good one. So that means that you like. Uh, I got to be careful on this one because a lot of I just have to be conscious of the age of a lot of people in the Pokemon universe. So got to be very, very careful with that. Uh, that being said, oh man, <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, I think it, I'm going to say two answers and you can judge me either way you want for this one. My safe answer uh, is probably just Cynthia. That's just the easy one. And that's the only one I can think of off the top of my head right now. I'm going to put a caveat on this next one saying that Grown up of age, uh, goth girl Marnie is, is best girl and her theme song is iconic. So that would be one uh, for sure. Next question. The next Kingdom Hearts game is actually going to be a spinoff following a side character. Whose character would you want to see explored solely and more in depth? I'm going to answer this question without having a lot of knowledge out of all of the games I've played, all the Kingdom Hearts games. There's two things that have eluded me. The end of the mobile game that I don't know too well, just because after three years of playing it pretty consistently, I just I just had to stop. And there is a additional counterpart in the mobile game called Kingdom Hearts Dark Road, 
which follows the adventures of some of the adventures of Master Xehanort in his youth, in his time at Scala Ad Kylum. And so this answer might seem stupid in retrospect when I get to those episodes in Guiding Keys. And then the only other game I haven't played, but I know the story of where it's going, is Melody of Memories. So I think with all those caveats, I would like to get a game that explores a bit more of the history of Master Ericus. Master Ericus is a character in that first gets introduced to us in Birth by Sleep and has an expanded role in Dark Road because he comes up alongside Master Xehanort. They were old friends for a while until a, a difference in ideology kind of drove them apart. And I think it'd be interesting to explore his character a little bit more because, like I said, he is really the other side of the coin to Master Xehanort where Master Xehanort is the Seeker of Darkness. Master Ericus eventually becomes a more traditional Keyblade Master who stays in one spot and kind of raises the next generation of, of Keyblade wielders. But I have to imagine that he has some adventures before that because the time between his youth during Dark Road and his time in Birth by Sleep, there's there's a lot of time passage there because I would say in, in Birth by Sleep, he's he's on the older side. So I think having a game centered around Master Ericus that's not a spinoff game, that's not a mobile game, that's not like some kind of cheap gimmick that's like a, a fully fleshed out kind of action style game in the way of two or three would be very cool. I don't know if the character is popular enough to warrant that kind of a game, which is where he's kind of been regu relegated to the side content and stuff. But I think it'd be interesting to get a bit more of his perspective and follow him in some of his adventures in his earlier years would be a really cool thing they could expand on. They would only do it if it serves the greater Kingdom Hearts mythos. That would be the only way they would do it. Next up, we have the famous trifecta question. Fuck, Mary, kill Pokemon professors Elm, Sycamore, and Magnolia. For those of you who don't know, uh, Elm and Sycamore are both dudes, and Magnolia is an old woman. So I feel like this is kind of a <laughs> gotcha question from Jared, but uh, I'm going to do my best to answer here. So uh, easy right off the bat, I'm going to kill Professor Elm. He's just kind of like a weird-looking professor. Never really did care for him that much. Uh, I would... <laughs> I would... I would marry Professor Sycamore because he's probably the most handsome. It sounds kind of vain, but I would marry Professor Sycamore and I guess I would be stuck fucking Professor Magnolia because I don't really have a good reason for it. It's just in my heart, that feels like the right question to an answer or that feels like the right answer to a question that doesn't have a right answer. So uh, that is going to be all I say on that one. Next question, he asks, Scalebound is coming back and you get to spearhead the development by picking the team to develop it. Who are you choosing to tackle this project? So the easy, boring answer right away is I would want Platinum to have another swing at this project. Uh, Hideki Kamiya has long said that this is like his dream project. He loves monsters. He loves dragons. He loves dinosaurs. So uh, I would like to see Platinum get another shot at this to get it right. If somehow to just to give a little bit more of an interesting answer if if you were somehow able to disentangle this ip from the behemoth that is microsoft which would be a legal nightmare uh, i would like to see the team behind final fantasy 16 do it creative business unit 3 i believe and this has come out with this would take my age poorly because this i'm recording this episode before final fantasy 16 is out but final fantasy 16 looks insane with its combat and the way it's got giant idolins or whatever they're called giant summons fighting one another so i think that team could do a lot of really cool things with that kind of concept between a, a human and a dragon partnership so i think that would be insane as much shit as i give square enix uh, if final fantasy 16 is good i'd like them to take a shot at at scalebound even though it's that's unrealistic he next Next question from Jared. Nomura is making a new Kingdom Hearts game. Would you prefer one of the following? A Battle Royale, a Kart Racer, or a Smash clone? I thought about this one for a little bit. When you're talking about Nomura, you have to understand that everything he does is in service to the story, whether it makes sense, whether it works. Most of the times, his games are very fun to play, and a lot of the times, he hides little things in the gameplay that service the story overall 
So he's on the opposite spectrum. I was like, if you go on the other end of that spectrum, Miyamoto is very famously like, the game has to be fun. If it's fun for me to play, it'll be fun for others. That is the most important thing above all. Nomura, while understanding the desire and need to make a fun game, does everything in service to the narrative for the fans so that they can speculate about it. So I approach this question with what genre of game would best be positioned to service the greater Kingdom Hearts narrative. Uh, a battle royale I don't think would be able to do that, and I think that that idea kind of already failed because we had uh, Final Fantasy VII Soldier First Class or whatever that mobile game was that was a battle royale, and that was horrible. So I think that you immediately scratched that one off. A uh, kart racer, well, it would be cool because you could use Kingdom Hearts and Disney characters. I just don't think there's any way to kind of incorporate a story into that. Uh, Crash Team Racing has the greatest kart racing story in the history of video games, so I don't think there's any topping that. So I think the easiest choice would be a Smash clone, and as lambasted as that would get because Square Enix is already trying to do Splatoon, I think you could weave the mythos of Kingdom Hearts into a Smash clone, especially if you do something like Subspace Emissary from Smash Bros. Brawl, which is still one of my favorite Smash things that has ever been done. Subspace Emissary is insane. It's it's so good. So you have the ability to tell those stories within that context. And I think the character roster in Kingdom Hearts is deep enough to where it could support a Smash clone. So you have, obviously you'd have Sora, Riku, Kairi, all the members of the organization, Axel, Xehanort, and some Seeker of Darkness. You could toss some Disney characters in there. there. There's enough Kingdom Hearts characters there that that kind of style of game could work and would service the overall Kingdom Hearts mythos. Another one I'm throwing in hashtag don't post here. We all know Kingdom Hearts characters have huge feet, but who has the cutest toes? Not overthinking it too much. It's probably Kyrie, right? I would just assume based on the available roster of characters. I'm not going to touch that one anymore. We're moving on. You have to swap the main characters of two games. Which games are you picking and why? I thought about this one, again, a lot. And I don't know if this works at all. I thought it would be comical. I'm putting Leon Kennedy in Luigi's Mansion. And then I'm putting Luigi in Resident Evil 4. Because I just think that would work out just fucking brilliantly. I just... I was imagining Moody Leon having to deal with the ghosts in this mansion and trying to rescue Mario. And it was just cracking me up. I, I thought it was the, the most hilarious thing. And then on the flip side of that, I was just imagining <laughs> Luigi having to deal with like Los Plagas or whatever is going on in this, the Spanish countryside and having to like deal with Ashley. Well, he's also like equally as scared as she is. So yeah, Leon Kennedy is going to Luigi's mansion and then Luigi is going to, to Resident Evil. Another question from Jared. You get to do podcasting full-time. All of your energy and time can now be dedicated to the podcast. Are there any wild ideas you have for the show that you would want to do, but just don't have time for? Man, that's that's the dream, isn't it? Everyone hopes that their creative endeavor would be able to support them. If it ever got to that point, I would be extremely blessed. Yeah, there are, there are some wild ideas. I think, so the reason I went down to two episodes a month was just because the time drain for for guiding keys because that is such an in-depth process to, to craft and create those episodes and the, the amount of thorough analysis I'm doing on them. I would really like to be able to run multiple of these deep dive series at once so I could work on more games than one. And I may be able to do that in the future. It may just be because Kingdom Hearts is so big and so unwieldy that I just... By the time I do one episode of Guiding Keys, especially these past Kingdom Hearts 2 episodes that have come through, it was like five episodes and each of those episodes is like roughly two hours but really after I get done cutting everything and going over my mistakes and splicing in all the audio it's really more you know I, I cut it down from like three to two hours of audio probably and then after I splice in all the, the cutscene audio which is editing for each one of those episodes is probably like a minimum four hours to line all that up uh, more often than not it's more like probably six so the production time for each one of those guiding keys episodes is like like 10 hours. And and that and that's not even counting like the amount of time I spend doing research, taking notes, and just making sure those are like I I can explain the story as best as I possibly can. So I think the future of unlockables in general is gonna be a lot more specific. 
like full through retrospectives of like specific series. I've already got a couple of other ones that I'd like to do. Um, I announced two other ones this year that I just haven't been able to get to. I, I one called the house of Mario and one called visions of fantasy, which are going to be final fantasy and, and Mario kind of retrospectives and stuff. I was going to do with that. And I just, those are in my back pocket. I will still do those at one point, but as of right now, it's like, I have to finish. I o- I can only finish focus on kingdom hearts. And then I have time to do other side stuff to kind of break up the monotony. Cause nobody wants a year of kingdom hearts content. Like I, I, I know you guys enjoy me rambling about it, but I just don't feel like in general, a year of kingdom hearts content is feasible. So I'd like to be able to have a couple of mini series like running at the same time. Uh, I've played with a couple a couple other ones like I'd like to do one on Halo the bungee days of Halo I think is really fascinating and then their transition over to Destiny so th- that's some stuff like that um I've wanted to do like a Metroid retrospective which I feel like I could get away with because I could just do like the mainline Metroid games Metroid 1 through 5 whatever they're calling them and then maybe do like Prime by itself uh I've toyed with metal gear solid because it has a batshit crazy story and that would be a great follow-up to guiding key so there's there's other ideas there it's just i if i had the time to do it i would be doing that aside from like getting guests on the show so that that's really the direction that i want to take take the show and my reason for cutting back is because i I, i've realized that i don't think unlockables is an every week type of show especially if i want to do something to to that standard that I have for guiding keys, which I think is a pretty high standard that I've set for myself. Jared's next question. You, you have to bring a team of three podcasters to fight off a video game boss of your choosing. What's the boss and who's on the squad? I had a really hard time with this because I would take any one of you guys into battle with me. Different podcasters areas of expertise would determine who I bring with when it it really is having like a gigantic party, like final fantasy six or, you know, a fire emblem where it's just like, you have so many characters and you can't bring them all, but you want to. Uh, so as to not overthink this and not to exclude anybody, uh, I decided that I would go with like really the first three people I remember meeting during the whole podcasting adventure and really the first three people that kind of supported what I was doing. So I would go Keith from main quest podcast. I would go Ryan and Brian from list off. I'm getting the double there and I would go Dave, uh, from tales from the backlog just because they were the first ones there. So if, I was ever having to fight a boss, I would be calling them up first, <laughs> I guess, probably. Uh, and I thought about this a lot. There could be any number of bosses, but I feel like we're fighting the giant adamantoys turtle from the end of Final Fantasy 15. That's like a two hour fight. Just because I want to hear Keith be just mad about how fucking long it's taking us to kill this turtle <laughs> would be my main reason for wanting to, to pick that fight. But, uh, any number of great boss fights uh, those guys would be awesome with. The redacted fight from one near the end of Kingdom Hearts 3 that I don't want to bring up because it's such a cool fucking fight, but that would also be a very cool fight to have those guys involved with. This is Jared's last question and it came with a caveat because he said, and lastly, because I'm not a crazy person with a winky face emoji, you wake up in a pitch black room. As you come to, you see a light slowly approaches you. A ghastly figure holding a dimly lit candle hovering is inching its way closer and closer. As the figure approaches you, he reaches out his hand and tells you, you've died and that your hell is watching someone poorly play through only the first level of Super Mario World for all eternity. But he has a proposition for you that you may come back to the world of the living except the only game you're allowed to play is Lord of the Rings Gollum. What are you choosing? Oh, man. (laughs) Talk about a situation that sucks because uh, if there's one thing I'm impatient for, it's watching people play games badly that I know how to play. It's very frustrating. (laughs) I don't know what it is, especially Super Mario World, my third favorite game of all time, and one of the first games I ever played. So that would be hard to sit and watch that for, for all eternity. But Lord of the Rings Gollum is a fucking awful game. First of all, side tangent here. This infuriates me because I love Lord of the Rings as a fantasy, as a movie. Uh, I've enjoyed a lot of the games that have come out. So I'm a lifelong fan of Lord of the Rings. It is one of the most important things to me in my life. I read all those books when I was like in fifth grade. and I've read the Silmarillion. I've read a lot of the extended universe works. And... 
ah, that just that game breaks my heart. If I had to choose being stuck for all eternity in a hell where somebody plays the first level of Super Mario World poorly, sounds like some Greek Sisyphus level tragedy of just absolute suckage, like pushing the boulder up the hill and then it rolls down. And I have to do that for all eternity. That sounds like it sucks. Like, at least if I come back to life, I can see my loved ones and be with the people I care about and have a little bit more time and then like die at the end of my life and then maybe get a better reward in the afterlife. <laughs> maybe it sure it would suck that I would only be able to play the Gollum game or, and that would basically not allow me to play any other video games ever at all. But I just think that languishing in a hell <laughs> that has nothing for me except super Mario world being played poorly is outweighed by the fact that I would sure I wouldn't be able to play any other video games here but at least I would still get to see the people I care about and try to live a somewhat normal life and be a better person and get a better afterlife reward <laughs> so I think that's going to be my answer unfortunately I now have to only play the Lord of the Rings Gollum game and this is officially the number one Lord of the Rings Gollum podcast from here going forward Next, we have a couple of questions from my good friend, Rick Firestone, from the Pixel Project Radio podcast. And he has two questions, a video game question and a non-video game question. So the video game question first, what's a trend in modern gaming, a game mechanic, a company practice, general direction, et cetera, that you dislike? Would you get rid of it or change it in some way? Well, Rick, and the <laughs> just so I don't seem like I'm standing on my soapbox here. There's a lot about modern gaming that I don't particularly enjoy. Uh, let me just list a couple of my fine points off the top of my head. I don't enjoy the tribal like console wars that pit people against each other. I don't enjoy how much people bitch about video games being bad when none of the people bitching about video games could like realistically make a video game by themselves. So, uh, you know, the disrespect towards like developers and development companies uh, by psychotic members of the general gaming populace really pisses me off. But I think the biggest thing that I don't like about modern gaming in general, it isn't one specific mechanic or design philosophy or something like that. I guess it would be a design philosophy. We don't allow games to just end anymore. And part of the reason I appreciate games and I appreciate stories in games is because they use to end and I know this might sound hypocritical coming from me because kingdom hearts is my favorite franchise of all time and that game's been going on for 20 years so it might sound a little bit hypocritical but one of the reasons that final fantasy 9 is my favorite game is because that game has a beginning a middle and it ends and they've done nothing else with it it is what it is it can be fully dissected in the context of which it exists and that is that the original Halo trilogy, while obviously being a product of Microsoft wanting to make more money, uh, Bungie had a concrete story that they wanted to tell. And when they ended with Halo Reach, they asked Microsoft if they could move on to something else. And they went and partnered with Activision to work on Destiny. The shitty thing about Destiny is that Destiny had a 10-year plan from the start, and they kind of ushered in this continued cyclical storytelling with this seasons and a story that like doesn't end. So it's very, I've just found that games that kind of had that philosophy from the start, because obviously if you're designing a game from that start, from that philosophy and you're designing it to not end, it impacts the way in which you can tell the story. So you can have certain moments that are final within the context of that specific story, but the overarching story as a whole you have to keep your protagonists alive. You have to, you know, keep your world alive. You can't like just destroy the world and just have the game end that way because it's kind of hard. So I feel like when you have a game that doesn't end, you really have to write it and tell the story in a way that is planned for the game to not end. And to me, that just takes a little bit of the soul out of the storytelling because like I said, I like when things have like a concrete end. I, I thought the end of the Halo trilogy was like a really good way to end that story. Obviously you leave a cliffhanger. Obviously you can't bring it back and stuff like that. But like I said, Final Fantasy IX is a beautiful self-contained story. Even the original Kingdom Hearts games, uh, one Chain of Memories and two, if you just, if you silo those games off and just look at them by themselves, that's a really beautiful self-contained 
story. And if Kingdom Hearts would have ended after Kingdom Hearts 2, it would have been a really pretty solid uh, storytelling-wise trilogy of, of games. But obviously, because of money and, and corporatism and stuff like that, you need to keep putting them out because they're making money and the fans demand more of them. Destiny's been going nonstop since the mid-2010s. I mean, part of the reason I like Nintendo games so much is because they do this more often than not. I mean, each Mario game is kind of its own self-contained Mario, so I don't have to worry about it that much. Even each Legend of Zelda, with the exception of a few, I guess with the exception of Tears of the Kingdom, are like their own contained games. And yes, they reference things that happen in other games, and there's the timeline and stuff, but you can go into pretty much any Legend of Zelda game and play it without be having to worry about the wider mythos as a whole. Or, and those games like rack up pretty concretely, and their the whole thing is like, well, yeah, it's just an endless timeline loop, and it just happens over and over in the timeline and stuff like that. So I don't know if I've made my point there, but it's just like it sucks that games don't end. And we're just in this era now where like every game wants to be destiny and have like this 10 year life cycle and every game wants to be Fortnite and every game wants to be Call of Duty Warzone. And it's just, there's too much saturation of that live service type of game to be feasible. I mean, there are only so many, there's only so much time that people can devote their time to. Now I think destiny might be one exception to that because the lore of destiny is absolutely fucking bonkers and the lore that Bungie built around Destiny and around Halo is always been just absolutely fucking insane they've been great not only are they great uh gameplay designers they've been great storytellers but it's just like a 10 10 years for 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 Destiny a Destiny feels ancient at this point like it really does and it's just like and two it's like how do you want to like in 10 years from now if I want to do a, a retrospective on the Destiny series because it's morphed into this live service game in the way it tells its story, how do I go about playing that and experiencing the story of Destiny when it changes with every season that comes out? Destiny 2 is drastically different from the game that it originally launched as. Destiny 1 was drastically different from the way that it was launched as. You can never experience the early days of Destiny the way it was intended ever again. So it's just, you're losing video game history there. And I, it's, I don't know. I don't know if I made my point there if, or if any of that, my insane ramblings make sense. But just the finality of some video games is, is nice. And I kind of miss that growing up. Now for Rick's non-video game question. You get to replace the entire cast of a movie except for one main character with Muppets. Which movie do you choose? God, the, the fucking Muppet question. This question is S tier. It's so good because there are so many incredible answers for this. Uh, my gut instinct right away, like I referenced a couple questions ago because I love it so much, was Lord of the Rings. Uh, it was to keep Ian McKellen as Gandalf and have everybody else be Muppets. Everybody in the Fellowship, all the orcs, Saruman, uh, literally everybody. Uh, Miss Piggy could be Galadriel. Uh, all the orcs could be animals. Fozzie could be Gimli. Uh, I, Kermit would probably be Aragorn. Merry and Pippin would be uh, Sattler and Walorf, the, the old guys who just like kind of just fuck around and tease each other all the time. That's kind of the extent that I got with the Lord of the Rings Muppet universe, but I think that would be that would be absolutely brilliant. Uh, the second one that I thought of, this is probably a cheesier answer, but having Robert Downey Jr. act with Muppets in an Avengers movie would be just fucking golden. I know that the MCU gets a lot of hate nowadays like it's obviously past the point of its peak popularity where people are just kind of tired of it but Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man Tony Stark has always been one of the best castings in Hollywood ever like that when you understand the way that Tony Stark is and like that casting for that character is is so good the one thing Marvel does really well is they they cast incredibly well you can't you can't argue that having RDJ just act with Muppets in like Avengers movies would be just peak uh, I, oh it'd be fantastic it'd be so so good next we have a question from our good friend chris at one hour one decision he asks why are you such a beautiful soul i can't answer that chris because uh technically since it's been defined by south park i am a ginger and i have no soul so all this emotion up here i just kind of fake it uh, really i'm the nobody if you think about it i don't have any emotions i just fake having emotions so i don't know how i was able to obtain said beautiful soul because I don't have one. <laughs> Unless I've just been using this podcast to slowly siphon off all of your souls as you listen. Think about that.
Next up, we have an incredible friend of the show, Phil from Deleted Saves, who comes to us with a basket of questions. So first up, you are forced to play through every survival horror title, all of them in one week. Which one scared you the least? So uh, I'm going to dive into a little bit of my video game history here, Phil. I actually haven't really had any experience with any survival horror games, even Resident Evil, even Silent Hill, some of the more known ones, Dead Space. I just never played them and I never got around to playing them. I have an interest in playing Dead Space and Resident Evil and a lot of them. And, you know, I've heard PT is a, is a legendary <laughs> demo game that is only locked on play, PlayStation 4s that got it now. But, uh, you know, if I was to, to play one that would scare me the least, it would probably be one of the middle Resident Evil games, like five or six or seven, maybe. Uh, I've heard those are more action oriented. I think I could probably stomach that a little bit easier than some of the more psychological horror ones. I think I, I've lied. I've also played The Evil Within, so that's uh, a lie on my part. But yeah, probably the the middle Resident Evil games that are a little bit more action-oriented, I'd probably have no problem with just because it's, they seem very much like that. More of like that Gears gory type of... something that wouldn't freak me out too much. So I think that would probably be my answer on that one. Uh, next question is, Square and Nomura do a fuck this, I'm out, and send KH4, Kingdom Hearts 4, to a new developer, publisher. Who is it? So even if that were to happen, that would be a <laughs> legal and logistical nightmare. I don't know. I'm going on a side tangent here. I think the way it works is that Disney is allowing Nomura to like do whatever he wants story-wise with Kingdom Hearts, but I think the deal that they have in place in order for Nomura to be able to use the Disney characters is that Disney controls the rights, the IP, all that stuff for Kingdom Hearts is, I believe, how that works. So really, Disney could just decide to take it and take it away from Nomura and go home, which I think is uh, a shame. And honestly, I'm kind of at the point where I feel like Kingdom Hearts has outgrown the need for the Disney characters because... That whole marriage of convenience was convenient for both Square and Disney. Square was looking for characters that had a high recognition amongst uh, their target audience to compete with Mario. And Disney was looking for a way to break into the Japanese market just because, well, in the West, their animated films were dominating around this time. They didn't do quite as well in Japan, so they thought that this... Uh, marriage between themselves at the height of their power and Square at the height of its power in the you know, late 90s, early 2000s would give them the foothold that they would need uh, in the Japanese market. But if it did come to that and somehow it got transferred around, my first gut instinct that when I read this question first, the first developer that came to my mind was, was Platinum Games. Uh, they seem to do like this crazy intense style that I think would fit the Kingdom Hearts universe. Uh, I'm just immediately thinking of of Bayonetta, how action oriented that game is. So I think Platinum would do a really, really great job with that. And I think they've done some combat systems for some other games as well. So I think they really would understand that aspect of the game. I don't know if anyone would be able to match Nomura's storytelling, but in terms of pure gameplay, Platinum would be a great one. Uh, second one, just kind of out of left field, this one, not for any particular reason other than they've been on fire lately. Uh, I think I would want Insomniac to do it. Insomniac Games, if they could get pulled away from making Marvel licensed properties, which they're probably going to be making for the next 10 years. Uh, Insomniac's been hitting on all cylinders lately. Spider-Man and Spider-Man Miles Morales were fantastic. Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart were fantastic and looked absolutely beautiful. The upcoming Spider-Man 2 game looks incredible. So I just think the pedigree of Insomniac right now is, is second to almost none. And I think they would do an absolutely fantastic job just because both those games too are third person action oriented games. So I think that uh, they would be able to do a really, really great job with that. What is your favorite unpopular opinion? Uh, I would say my most consistent Unpopular opinion is that Rockstar is overrated. Narratively, I think GTA and Red Dead Redemption are very good stories, but my God, those are not <laughs> great modern video games. Uh, in GTA 5, I believe if I remember the control scheme correctly, you're tapping A to run. It's like, who, what control scheme is this? And just the way the game feels, the driving feels very good, but just the moving around in the world I don't think has aged particularly well. 
You can't say, oh, well, that game, it was a game from like 2012 or t- the early two- that late 2000s and early 2010s and it's been remade over and over. Like, I get that, but there are games that I can go back to even then that control so much better <laughs> than, than GTA, I-, I think. And same thing kind of Red Dead Redemption 2 as well, just kind of the controls just feel like sluggish and and outdated and unnecessarily it's like if i stuck my controller in molasses and then pulled it out and tried to play the game i so you know narrative wise and world building wise you know rockstar is one of the best in the game but i just i just think it's you know some people say the same thing about bethesda and releasing skyrim over and over i say the same thing about rockstar it's just i don't think rockstar is i'm just not as impressed as anybody else and you know, I don't think I'll care as much whenever they announce Grand Theft Auto 6 or whatever their their next game is. And they kind of push the video game industry in a direction that I'm not really a huge fan of with like they've made two games in the last decade. Whereas like before Rockstar made like an incredible lineup of games, you know, like Bully and I believe Max Payne was one of theirs as well. So they've just kind of abandoned all their other IPs. Just be like, hey, we can just make like, one game for like 10, 15 years and just support it so uh yeah it really kind of stifles creativity and i don't like that so yeah rockstar nah i'm not a big fan of them in my book i just think they're kind of overrated (laughs) so this next question absolutely fantastic a train leaves new york city at 5 a.m eastern traveling 75 miles an hour and where it is currently five degrees fahrenheit it is destined for la where it is currently 78 degrees fahrenheit how long will it take to get to la assuming the speed remains constant what time will it arrive and why will it derail in a fiery crash in indianapolis and at about what time will the local alcoholic sheriff arrive at the scene only to discover that this was no accident so this is a fantastic question maybe a stroke of fate i don't know if phil knew this or not but i live in indiana so the train derailing near indianapolis makes way too much sense for me because uh indiana is <laughs> a very interesting state uh, I would I would rank it down there somewhere with like all the Midwest states in general are very, <laughs> very interesting to begin with. But uh, an alcoholic sheriff in a town outside of Indianapolis tracks makes total sense to me. Uh, the thing I would question in this question, Phil, is when do the unmarked uh, government vehicles and men in black suits arrive to pay off the alcoholic sheriff to tell everybody in the town that it was an accident and that there's nothing to see here and the train was carrying nothing of importance don't nothing to see here don't need to worry about it and oh you're throwing up that's just the seasonal flu that's not the dangerous chemicals leaking into the water supply i don't think you have to worry about that at all just take timmy to the doctor it'll be fine you know deal with it in 30 years when he has severe crippling health problems down the road because by then statute limitations will run out and it'll be impossible to sue and the world will be on fire anyways so what does it really matter right i think that is (laughs) the significant series of events that would play out the government would be on the scene immediately it'd be a big cover-up just like you know i think that's what they did with that train that derailed in ohio like that i don't know if ever that ever got cleanly resolved or they ever compensated those people for that norfolk southern still getting away with all that shit oh man i'm getting political on this video game podcast oh boy here's the actual real train related question how come we're the only fucking developed nation in the world that doesn't have high speed rail why don't we have high speed rail High-speed rail, you could take a train from, like, the Midwest to, like, L.A. in, like, under a day. And, like, nonstop. And it would just revolutionize the way people travel. You wouldn't have to have as much fucking airplane travel. Like, why do we not have high-speed rail? What is, what are we doing with our lives? Sorry, I got got on a little uh, political rant there. But uh, let's move on to Phil's next and final question. If you could travel back in time to a historic location, but you knew you would be drafted to fight in whatever war was going on at the time... When would it be and what battle? Yeah, this is a good one. I am a closet history enthusiast. I love learning about history. I love learning about uh, battles and and wars and uh, stuff of of that nature. I have two answers to this question. I don't have a specific battle, but I think the period I'd like to go back. If I could just go back and like be like a bystander, be like in the army, just watching what was going on. Uh, I think any one of the battles from Napoleon's earlier campaigns when he was on the rise would be uh, quite a spectacle. Uh, his success compared to most other military leaders is is really unrivaled, and his tactical innovations during that period consistently gave him an edge over the European alliances that he found himself 
fighting against the the greatest powers of his time, you know, England and the the Prussians and and uh, I think it was Austria, Hungary and and all of these big alliances that came to fight him. And he just smoked them all uh, up until his his later years when his rivals kind of caught up with him. So I think seeing that would be utterly fascinating. Uh, my second answer to that is I've always had a really, really interesting fascination with the three kingdoms period of Chinese history, like right after the fall of the Han Dynasty. And I blame my love of Dynasty Warriors for that because back on the PS2 in like 360 days, I played like six or seven Dynasty Warriors games and I learned those games are loosely based on the Three Kingdoms era of Chinese history at the post Han Dynasty. And so I've always been really interested in that because you hear about like European history and then like Chinese history is just insane with like the number of people that die and the atrocities that are carried out and you think game of thrones is complicated the three kingdoms era is a era of history that is just filled with backstabbing and betrayal and wars for power and historical drama so i think those would probably be my my two answers and yeah napoleon or the the three kingdoms period of the the han the the post han dynasty the three kingdoms period uh, of chinese history Next up, we have Colby Moyer of the Switch It Up podcast. Good friend Colby, and he has two questions. He asks, first of all, you are the government and decide to put the entire podcast community into a Hunger Games co-host of shows are allowed to be teammates. Who would you pick to win? So this is another one where he's kind of like putting me on the spot to where I like have to choose one of my podcasting friends to be like, who could possibly win in this kind of Hunger Games showdown? And so I kind of started doing a really big deep dive on this, right? I kind of consider, well, you know about the Hunger Games, it's a different arena every time. They have like a cornucopia in the middle with like all these supplies, uh, all these different factors that could, could factor in. And I thought of a couple people at first. I wanted to, my first gut instinct was to pick the Retro Hangover Boys because, you know, the Dick Dragon, and I think that that's a, a big advantage they would have over a lot of people. But after thinking about it for a second, I thought about who I know on my podcasting circle of friends. And there's one pair of podcasting hosts and friends that specialize in arena style showdown tournaments that take you to arenas that may put you out of your element. So for no reason other than that, and based on the content of their show, I think that uh, Jay and Aliyah from the Super Bracket Bros would do incredibly well in a Hunger Games style podcaster uh, showdown. I think they have a lot of experience gaming out competitive scenarios with fictional characters and I think that would serve them very well in their analysis and their ability to to survive a all-out death match in the podcasting community so super bracket bros are the inaugural podcasting hunger games champions and you guys can take that to the bank so question number two from Colby asks aside from making friends and getting to interact with people on a daily basis what has been the most rewarding part of the podcasting journey for you personally and are you content with how things currently stand or do you have greater aspirations um yeah you know it's something i think about a lot and i think i would be lying if i didn't say i did have i didn't have grander aspirations for the show i think as content creators all of our dreams are to be able to make a living doing the thing that we love to do so if ultimately this was able to like take on some kind of life of its own and I was one day able to make a living off of doing content around video games whether that's the podcast or some kind of live stream show or, or something like that or or videos uh, I, I definitely would like to do that it's just that I always want the show to keep growing but as of right now it's at a point where it's it's more than I ever thought it ever would be, even though it's still a relatively small show. And the people that I've met have really been the highlight. And to me, that's been the measure of success more than numbers or metrics or, or patrons or anything like that. It's been the people that I've known and have gotten to talk about video games with over the past couple of years. If I could turn into something and, you know, make this more, make it a bigger, I would certainly bring some people with me if it just grows into something that's beyond my capability to handle on my own, but also in a way too, I'm thankful for it because I think it is 
increased my skills as a speaker, as a person who records audio. You know, I've gotten to get experience with all kinds of tools I never would have had the experience to as well. I feel like my skills as a graphic designer have grown too, as I've kind of pushed myself to try new things and learn new things. My skill with Photoshop as small as it may be, has grown immensely in the last couple of years that I've been doing this show. So I would like to see it continue to grow. I think that would make me very happy. But as of right now, I'm kind of happy where it's at. And I just think we'll see what the natural progression of, of the show is. I'm not putting forth like my maximum effort to try and make it as grand of a thing as it possibly could be. It, it's just a side hobby right now. And I'm, I'm treating it like a side hobby. And I'm devoting the time to it is to what a side you would devote to a side hobby like obviously if you're trying to be a professional basketball player professional and whatever like you're devoting most of your time to that thing like this is very much a thing that I'm doing when I have time and it kind of ballooned in size and some of those Kingdom Hearts episodes caused me to be like hey I need to just cut back it is a hobby after all so that's what led me to cut back to a couple episodes a month so I would love it to be more than what it is but right now just with the time that I have I'm happy with where it's at Hope that answers your question. Next up, we have Nick from Friday Night Gamecast, another fantastic friend of the show. And he asks, what are your thoughts on expanding your content beyond audio? Ever think about getting into video work as well? Or would you prefer to stay audio only for the unlockables? So before I even started podcasting, I would say that I dabbled in doing video first. I was inspired by the early 2010s, mid 2010s YouTubers to like make video content around video games and make let's plays. I made some let's plays with friends that are now thankfully gone and removed from the internet because they were quite dreadful. And for a time I tried to be a Twitch streamer, which is a video format. So I originally wanted to do video. It's just that to me, video was very intimidating. And to me, video was more time consuming than doing a podcast because it was like, oh, I have to write scripts or I have to actually play the games and then I have to edit. And then, you know, that you're just, you're doing video clips and audio clips instead of just, you know, audio clips. I, I really chose podcasting because it seemed like the most convenient thing for me to be able to make content around. And it was certainly like the the thing I was able to like, e like I didn't understand video that well. Uh, I took to understanding audio pretty pretty well after doing it for only about about a year. So it quickly became my preferred method for making content around video games. But I have really thought about the role of like making content things I'd like to do. And there has been that itch to want to return to maybe some streams a couple times a week or maybe even do some I, I really, really love long, like robust, long form YouTube retrospectives on video games. I would love to be able to like do something like that. And it's always been in the back of my mind. Recently, I've been thinking more about video content on the short form side, because that seems to be like what is most popular and being a marketing professional like that is what is getting like the most views and gets you the most popularity and stuff. Not that I'd be doing it for popularity, but uh, I have a lot of really interesting ideas that I think would really fit like the format of short term video. I would love to kind of expand my guiding key series to a short form video format where I and I bounced the idea off a couple people when I was calling it like Kingdom Hearts in 90 seconds where I would like explain a complicated Kingdom Hearts plot lore aspects in 90 seconds as like simply as I could and just do like a bunch of those videos and just kind of release them because I think those would do really well and then just kind of talking about maybe just like some random video game history stuff like I think short form has the potential to because the problem I have with long form is I tend to like ramble and especially when I'm scripting things I tend to write more than I have to and explain things more than I have to because I don't want my listener to be confused and I have to feel like if I don't say it in as many ways as possible then my listener might not understand what I'm talking about and really that's a problem with me not giving my listeners enough credit but when I write longer form things I tend to kind of get lost in the writing of it and I'll just like go on and on about things that don't necessarily have to do with the point I'm trying to make I think short form video would force me to make my points more succinctly. If I'm like, hey, I'm doing Kingdom Hearts in 90 seconds. I have a minute 30 to make the point I'm trying to make. What point is that? I think that that would allow me to just, I think that would make me better writer overall. I think it would be uh, make me better at video editing overall as I kind of learn how to edit videos better. And then maybe I use that as a stepping stone to like longer form 
video posts I'd want to work on. But just like right now, it's it's not in the cards. And I'm also not a person that would like want to steal footage from anybody else. So I would want to, if I'm making a retrospective, a, like a 50 minute retrospective on a game, I would want to capture all the footage now and that involve me playing the game. So that would just be more, I feel like there's more involved with getting video assets ready than there is with just sitting down, getting notes ready, inviting people on and talking in a microphone. So podcasting was ultimately a form of convenience, but as I've been doing it more and seeing the potential of what this could be, I've wanted to go back to and expand back into, into video. And I've also thought about that in the form, in the te- and I've also thought about that in the terms of like, well, what is, I don't want to be just putting out content just to put out content. So anything that I do with the podcast or with short form video or anything like that going forward, I want to make sure it serves a purpose and I'm calling it like responsible content. I want to make sure like if you get done watching it, you were either a entertaining, you laugh, it made your day a little bit better or two, you learn something from it in that 15 or 20 seconds that I held your attention. So I'm thinking about that a lot as well as I've kind of hit like a mid year lull in my unlockables content. And I've gone to two episodes a month where I'm like, what really do I want to be saying with my show? What content do I actually want to be making? So I hope that long rambling spiel answered your question, Nick. I apologize. Next up, we have Josh from the still loading podcast. Another good friend of the show. Uh, First one he asks, let's go, baby. He's going to let me geek out. What's one world in Kingdom Hearts you'd like to see added to the franchise? So this is this is if you look back at the history of the the worlds that have been included in the Kingdom Hearts franchise, they're actually a lot of the more popular ones have already been included, right? One that I would really like to see that is probably like a, a deeper cut, I th- and I think would do really really well in the Kingdom Hearts universe would be Treasure Planet. Now, the story around the Disney movie Treasure Planet is fascinating, if a little bit heartbreaking. Uh, That movie continues to be disrespected by Disney to this day. It is a fucking great movie, and I think it would make an absolutely incredible world. Also, if we're going to be doing live-action remakes of movies, Treasure Planet would be an incredible, incredible live-action movie for Disney. It would be awesome. Followed closely by Atlantis, The Lost Empire. But I just think the world of Treasure Planet would be more fascinating. I know we've already had like the pirate ship theme already. We've already had Neverland. We've had Pirates of the Caribbean. But it's I, we, it's got to be Treasure Planet. If I'm going on the Pixar side, this again, we already did Big Hero 6 in Kingdom Hearts 3. I think the world of The Incredibles would also be a super cool possibility just because I think with Big Hero 6, like The Incredibles would fit in the Kingdom Hearts mythos. And then the two off the top of the head that feel like inevitable conclusions are Marvel and Star Wars, right? There's too much money in those properties and too much time has gone by for them to not be included in Kingdom Hearts in some fashion, I feel like. And I don't know how I feel about this because I want the inclusion of any Disney thing in Kingdom Hearts to serve the overall Kingdom Hearts mythos. And I don't think Kingdom Hearts 3 quite succeeded in pulling that off. It kind of felt like to me like that Disney was more in the way. And I hope that it doesn't go this way in Kingdom Hearts 4. I don't want Disney to just strong arm and be like, yes, we have to include Star Wars and Marvel just because that's one, two of their most powerful IPs. I understand the appeal to want to do that, but I just don't know. And of those two properties, I feel like the lore of Star Wars would more easily fit with the lore of Kingdom Hearts, you know, the light side of the force, the dark side of the force. Kingdom Hearts has the light, the darkness, you know, the the, the in-between. So a lot of the, the lore from both of those properties kind of line up nicely. So I'm less hesitant about Star Wars, but I don't, I just, I have Marvel fatigue right now, and I don't know if I want Marvel in Kingdom Hearts, ultimately. I just, I don't think that I do. So... But if I had to pick one, it's Treasure Planet. Let's make it happen. Let's do it. It's a fantastic movie. And he asks, if you could pick one world to take out of Kingdom Hearts, which would it be? First easy answer, and any Kingdom Hearts fan will tell you this, fuck Atlantica from Kingdom Hearts 2. That world can burn. It can go die. I hate it so much. It is the stupidest thing that they've done in a game that I love so much. I fucking hate 
Atlantica and Kingdom Hearts 2. They turned it into this musical rhythm game. It's these really fucking cringy songs in a game that is full of some cringe moments for people that like I haven't been in the series long enough like I have. Uh, everything about Atlantica and Kingdom Hearts 2 makes me cringe. And that's not easy to do in in Kingdom Hearts. It makes me cringe so bad. It is unbearable. It's unbearable. I hate it. Please, what? who made that decision? Oh, God. Uh, a close second would be the Tron Legacy World from Dream Drop Distance. That game came out the same time as the long-awaited sequel, Tron Legacy. I don't actually know if like that was a long-awaited. I know there's like a cult following around Tron, but I don't really give a shit about Tron if I'm being 100% honest. And just the way they tried to do that world with like, Again, they did the Pirates of the Caribbean thing where they tried to make the characters look real and they tried to have like fake but real like CGI like Jeff Bridges in there. And it's just like, oh, no, it just it did not work. And I hate that world. and It made me cringe, too. Although the Tron Legacy world has one of the coolest boss fights and one of the coolest boss fight themes. And we'll get to that when we get to that in Guiding Keys. So that was a cash in for sure. And then the last one I'll get rid of is Frozen. Uh, Frozen is overrated. As a movie, as an animated film, it is big time overrated. Big Hero 6 and Tangled are the superior Disney movies in that style, superior movies from that era. I will not be taking phone calls on this uh, because it is just fact. So uh, Frozen was put in there strictly for a cash grab. It doesn't work. They put the fucking song in there, let it go. Like, like why? They didn't have to do that, and I hate it. I hate it so much. Thank you, Josh, for the questions. Next up, we have Brock, a.k.a. Brock the Swordsman, voice actor extraordinaire and great friend of the show. He asks, have you dabbled in D&D? If so, what was your experience like? If not, would you want to join a campaign? So first of all, Brock, uh, yes, I have dabbled in D&D uh, quite a bit. I was raised playing D&D. I started with uh, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, and then I played 3.5 quite a bit uh i learned playing dungeons and dragons from my uncle who played it a lot in his childhood when it first came out and for the past i'd say like 10 15 years i've had a group of friends that have like tried to play on and off less recently just because everybody's just kind of busy with life and stuff and you know when you have a group of four five six people that are trying to play together it's and everyone's got jobs and families and just life stuff going on it's hard to get that group of people together to play consistently so i would say for the last 10 15 years i've been playing on off uh i am a i'm very well versed in the rules for fifth edition uh, i'm nearly done with campaign two of critical role i'm a big fan of matthew mercer and the gang uh playing those i think they're fantastic I'm not quite as much of a role player because I think I suck at voices, but I do love playing and interacting with a, a fantasy world. So I've been looking for a ways to play more consistently and I've been looking for uh, campaigns who like play in. Mostly I've stuck to playing with my friends just because I feel more comfortable playing with them. But I would be open to any campaigns that people would want to throw my way, play online. Uh, yeah, just throwing it out there. D&D is one of my biggest biggest pastimes and i have just on my bookshelf over here i have basically every single book for for fifth edition i have player's handbook i have uh xanthar's guide to everything i have tasha's cauldron explorer's guide to wild mount uh, i got a bunch of that stuff uh then the two campaign books i have sitting on my shelf are horde of the dragon queen and rise of tiamat so i have that published quest line yeah i'm i'm a big fan of DD. i'm a big fan of tabletop it's a lot of fun and I would love to play more. Another great friend of the show, Alex from a Random Gamer's Corner, has a question and he asks, which Fire Emblem character do you think you can relate to the most? If nobody, then who do you think went through the most trauma? So I don't have a character that I relate to most. I have a character that I wish I was able to emulate more and that would be Hector from Fire Emblem, the one that came over, the first one on GBA, that one that came over. I think it's FE7, I think it's Blazing Blade known in the community uh he has a very like brash and upfront personality but is also fiercely loyal to his friends uh, i'm very like reserved and laid back i tend to err on the side of caution i tend to 
avoid conflict when I can uh, to the point where like I won't set boundaries and I'll just do anything I can to avoid conflict. So I, I'm not saying I want to be kind of like a brash dick like Hector sometimes is, but I just want to embody the more of like his personality traits that cause him to speak up and just speak his mind when he has to, whether it's the right time or it's not the right time. Uh, just to have a bit like more of a voice. And, you know, I like the aspect of his personality that is just really loyal to his friends. I've always uh, admired Hector's character. I've always admired the way he interacts with all of the other lords, all the other characters around him. He's been my favorite Fire Emblem character for a, a very, very, very long time. I, one of my favorite characters, probably up there close to another FE7 character, Pent. Uh, side tangent here. I love Pent's introduction. It's so fucking cool the way it's just like he's in the middle of the desert map and the the bandits are trying to mess with him and he's the mage general of Etruria and he's like, oh, well, that's not going to end so well for you. And you your party shows up like we have to rescue him. But like in reality, if you just leave Pent alone in the middle of the desert, he'll just kill literally everything. He'll kill literally everything that comes his way. And it's absolutely incredible. Who do you think went through the most trauma? Again, I'm showing my bias here. Pretty much every Fire Emblem character that has a parent goes through trauma at some point. Dimitri goes through a lot of trauma. He's one I think of uh, immediately. I think Corin goes through a lot of trauma just because of the way that Fates does like the dual split story and having to choose like one family over another. So I, I think Corin goes through quite a bit of bit of trauma. Uh, the one I constantly think about is. Ellawood in his situation, his situation sucks. Uh, his dad gets kidnapped and then his dad fucking dies. And then he basically kills Ninian when she turns into a dragon. And so his whole, that just kind of sucks. And then his ending in FE6 is, is pretty sad. So I just think that he has a lot of shit in his life that just doesn't go great for him. Uh, the twins from Sacred Stones have it pretty rough too. Their dad dies. Their entire kingdom gets destroyed. They have to watch their best friend be devoured by a demon from the inside and then like have to try and like rebuild the world after that game. So I think they have it pretty rough too. My good friend Tom, aka Red Rival 26, aka Streamer Extraordinaire, aka most knowledgeable man about video games and anime you may ever find across the entirety of the internet, asks simply favorite side character in a game. So my immediate answer was wrong the more I thought about it, because of course I was like, oh well, it's Vivi. That's an easy answer. But honestly, Looking back at FF9, Vivi is more of a main character than anybody in Final Fantasy IX, even more than Zidane. So he can't possibly be uh, a side character. If I had to pick some just like random ass side characters, uh, I immediately think of Baird from the Gears of War franchise. Just his kind of brash, sassy humor cracks me up every single time. And as well as his partner, uh, Augustus Cole, a.k.a. the Cole Train. I think Baird and Cole are two of like the greatest like side teammate characters you could possibly ever ask for. I love them so much. Uh, I also think Johnson in Halo is incredible. Uh, just something about Sergeant Johnson. And then when he dies in Halo 3, it's just, oh, God, it sucks. It sucks so bad. So, I yeah, those, uh, those Xbox and Xbox 360 shooters, I think, had some absolutely fantastic supporting characters. And just hearing, <laughs> hearing Cole train... Just screaming and just hearing Baird's sassy, sassy shit talking across the battlefield. Uh, it's so, it's so, so good. And my other answer for this, if we were focusing on just the first game, uh, Hornet from Hollow Knight is, a, is super intriguing with the story around her and everything that goes on. Uh, so much so that she was such an intriguing side character that she's getting her own game, which is incredible. So I uh, hope that answers that question. Good friend of the show, Rob from Rob Rants. If you haven't had a chance to go check out his podcast yet, it is very good. Go and check it out. Uh, has a couple of questions here. He asks, what is your biggest pet peeve? I had two answers to this, and I'm sure I've been caught in it, so you guys can call me out on this all you want. But uh, my biggest pet peeve in general is hypocrisy, and I cannot stand hypocrisy of people that say one thing or do another and that's what has been my biggest struggle in like the current political landscape is people who claim to like say one thing and, and like do another thing like, oh, we're for the American people. And then it's just like all the decisions you're making are actively hurting the people you say that you're for. It, it just drives me absolutely nuts. So hypocrisy. Um, this is especially prevalent because I'm about to go on a side tangent here. Uh, being raised in a religious home, a religious background, going to a private religious school. Basically my entire life, being part of the church my, for my entire life until I left for college, uh, I, you don't 
the hypocrisy in that is is monumental, right? It is absolutely enormous. And we can see that in the way that the right wing Christian nationalist is being is weaponizing the quote unquote word of God to attack people, uh, you know, LGBTQ people and trans people and minorities and people of color that aren't like them. It's like, it's hypocrisy of the highest order. Did you not read your own fucking book? The guy that is the main character of the book says to treat people the way you will want to be treated. That's his whole fucking message. Ignore everything else that was written. Like you can believe whatever you want about religion or, or Jesus or the character or, what, or like whatever you want to believe about it. Uh, the guy did say some pretty good things. And like one of the things he's like, he's like, yo, just treat people the way you would want to be fucking treated and treat them with kindness and niceness. And all the stories of him in the Bible, I remember very clearly, I took 12, 14 years of, of fucking like church and Bible study is of him hanging out with poor people, hanging out with people that society deemed quote unquote sinners. He wasn't hanging out with the holy people that claimed to be holy. So it's like, like the hypocrisy just just drives me nuts and just people that claim to be one, one thing but and yet are another. It just drives me nuts. Uh, also on the video game side, uh, people who make their console of choice their entire personality, what are you doing with your life? It is a machine that plays video games. It is a corporation. They do not care about you. They just care about the number of machines that they sell. So don't be part of the system. Don't be part of the console war. Uh, play your games wherever you want and don't be a fucking dick about it. That's all you need to say. Would you rather be born like Benjamin Button or age like normal? And this is tough because the idea of aging is not something I'm particularly fond of. I've already found now that I've crossed the hump to 30 that things just are a little bit different than they used to be when I was in my 20s, right? Just I'm, I'm a hair slower. Things creak a little more. Things hurt a little more. I feel the inevitable march of father time. So that doesn't appeal to me. But the most appealing thing about the Benjamin Button thing is that you would get youth and vitality as you age. But whereas you'd come into the world being able to make cognitive decisions and and theoretically being able to participate in everything that the world offers, uh, as you age in reverse and get younger, you know, once you pass 21 in the other way, you can't drink anymore. And then... School would be a weird thing, aging. and Like, our whole society is built around aging from young to old. So just to experience that in reverse would be so, so mind-blowing. And then at the end of your life, you're a tiny baby that, like, you have no cognitive functions, you have no logic, you have no, like, memories. At least, like, at the end of your life, I mean, God forbid you get, like, dementia or something, but at least at the end of your life, you're able to, like, reflect and look back upon like the things that you did and you still have like your family around and you're still able to like experience life for the most part. I mean, God willing. So I think I would still take the normal, normal process. I think I would still go from, from young to old because as you get older, you're able to draw on your life experiences and on all the mistakes that you've made and leverage that as you're experiencing the adult world. Whereas like, as you get, as you get younger, I would assume your brain would like go backwards and you'd get less mature as, as you age. So I think I'm going to go age like normal favorite Halloween costume. Uh, I'm boring. I haven't dressed up for Halloween in probably 10 years just because I have like no motivation to do anything. I dress up as Ash one Halloween. My mom made me like a really nice detailed Ash Ketchum costume and, and me and my cousin were, were Ash. And that was probably my favorite costume that I ever dressed up in just because my mom put so much time into it and it was exactly pretty much detailed from the shoes and the gloves and the vest and the hat. So that's probably one of my favorite things. We also dress up as Dragon Ball characters too, with like the vest and the undershirt and stuff. So that's probably another really cool one. Uh, so Rob, thank you for those questions. Really appreciate it. And then finally, to wrap it all up, we're just going to go with a simple question from good friend Chris from Novel Console. Uh, he just says, air quick top five foods. And God damn it, this is where I'm going to be exposed because... I just, I don't know anything about food. I'm a garbage food eater. Like my wife cooks the most amazing meals. Uh, I just like throw chicken patties in the oven and like when they're done, I eat them. Like that's the extent that I can fend for myself. So please do not judge me on my food tastes. Um, I'm going to try and be a little more in depth about them. Just not be like, oh, taco, 
pizza, chicken nugget. And I'll, I'll try and be a little bit more in depth, but uh, so top five, no particular order. So one, I am going to say tacos. I fucking love tacos, especially tacos, tacos at a authentic Mexican restaurant. I will smash like 10 tacos at a time. I, uh, oh, they're so good. Uh, number two, I have a, I still to this day, I can't beat the taste. I love pizza in general, but a really, really good slice of Chicago pizza. It doesn't necessarily have to be deep dish style. Uh, little known fact, everyone clowns Chicago for like, oh, deep dish isn't a real pizza. And that's what they think it is. But I would put Chicago thin crust up against any pizza in the country and say it's just as good. I know like New York and Detroit are like known more for thin crust, but these crazy people in Chicago make some mean, mean thin crust. And if you ever come through the Midwest and stop in Chicago, call me up. I'll drive up there. I'll take you to some absolutely fantastic hole in the wall pizza places that will just absolutely blow your mind. So uh, a really, really good slice of Chicago style pizza for sure. Uh, Number three, my wife makes these really amazing uh, like breaded chicken parmesans uh, that I put on like a nice French roll. And it's like a, we call it like a chicken Parmesan sandwich. It's really fucking great. It's one of my favorite things that my wife makes. It's so, so good. Uh, I absolutely love it. It's fantastic. Uh, number t- next one would probably be, uh, my wife makes this thing called, it's called like a one pot, like pasta Alfredo. And it's like where you make everything in like the same pot. And it's got like chicken. It's got a homemade Alfredo that she makes or oh, Alfredo sauce. It's really good. You use like a, a penne, noodle in it and uh she throws a bunch of other like spices some spinach in there and it's so so fucking good i love pasta uh probably the reason why i can't (laughs) have trouble losing weight because all the carbs because i absolutely love pasta it's so so good and she made like i said it's, it's called one pot uh alfredo and you just throw everything in there and mix it and cook it all and oh it's so so great and then finally i love like a Medium rare, maybe medium sometimes, just depends, kind of in there, like pink in, like kind of pink in the center, but not like too pink to the point where it's bloody. Uh, New York Strip, it's my favorite style of steak. I absolutely love it when I, when I splurge, like that's, that's what I get. So uh, to recap, New York Strip, uh, one pot Alfredo, uh, chicken Parmesan sandwich that my wife makes, uh, Chicago style sliced pizza, and then authentic tacos, Mexican restaurant. I, like I said, I'm not a food guy. I don't know like specifically like dishes or anything like that. Uh, a couple of the greatest foods I've ever had. Um, I love burgers. I love to go different places and try different burgers because one of the things you can't, it's, I know I said it's not my top five, but like I, you just can't beat a good old American style like cheeseburger. And I've been like more adventurous in trying like different burgers. Uh, two of the greatest foods I've ever had were burgers. And I had this burger at uh, Guy Fieri's restaurant in Las Vegas, and it's just this gigantic thick patty, got like two like nice toasted buns on top of it. I think they were sesame seed buns, and then scooped on there was like two scoops of his like signature trademark like Guy Fieri like mac and cheese, with like some spices and stuff on there and some sauce and one of the greatest things I've ever had. I know people like clown on Guy Fieri where he's like, oh, Flavor Town and all this stuff. But like his restaurants and like that burger, I, I still think about it to this day. It was absolutely incredible. And then I, another restaurant I ate at in Las Vegas, I ate at Gordon Ramsay's Burger. That's just what it was called. It was called Gordon Ramsay Burger. And uh, the E was taken out of it. So it's B-U-R-G-R, I think is how it was spelled. You know, you gotta be fancy about it. And I also had just like a, a burger there that had like uh, it was I think it was like a breakfast burger because it had like egg on it. It had bacon and it had like all this other stuff on it. And I had, again, similar one in Chicago. There was one me, my wife and I went to Chicago for our, our one year anniversary and down the street was Gordon Ramsay burger. And I had the same thing. It was really good. So uh, two of the best burgers I've ever had uh, from Mr. Gordon Ramsay and, of course, the mayor of Flavortown himself, Guy Fieri. So if you ever get a chance to eat at either one of their restaurants, I'd be curious to, to go. I've also had uh, Gordon Ramsay fish and chips, too. Fantastic. So if you're ever able to like go and eat at one of their restaurants, absolutely fantastic, absolutely fantastic food. But uh, that's going to wrap it up, the non-video game question. That was the last question. So, Chris, thank you so much. And everybody... Thank you so much for everybody who submitted questions and I hope I was able to answer them to your satisfaction. This episode ran way longer than I was expecting it to, even with 
uh, some of the more elaborate questions. Some of the more questions I know I answered longer than others uh, just because I went off on side tangents. But again, thank you guys so much to everybody who submitted questions. And well, you can bet that we'll be doing this again next year. And if at this rate, if we're getting any more questions than we already are getting, I'm going to have to turn this into like a two-parter. But uh, stay tuned for lots of great stuff to come this summer. We just wrapped up Kingdom Hearts 2. We'll be starting Kingdom Hearts 358 over two days in a little bit. So look for those episodes right around the corner and got some other great stuff waiting for you guys this summer. And remember, as always, it's not just the story of video games, it is the story of you. Thank you.